Hello and welcome to everyone who is joining us today. Today marked our final session in the Startup Founders series. And today we'll look at crossing the chasm. What do enterprise customers really want and need? So we have a fantastic lineup of panelists today. I'm really looking forward to hearing from each one of them. Today's session will run over the next 45 to, to 60 minutes. Please do ask any questions that you have throughout in the comment section. We'll make sure they're all answered by the end of today. Just a quick note on our code of conduct before we get started. So just a reminder to everyone who is with us today to be aware of others, be friendly and welcoming throughout. It's an inclusive environment today. Um, so just to really be understanding of everyone's differences as we run through today's session. So without further ado, I will hand over to our panelists today. Thanks very much. Uh, hi, my name is Steve Thayer. I'm the CTO and co-founder at DevOps Group, uh, and I'm going to be sort of the moderator of the panel today. Um, and the topic to today really is, is looking at this idea of crossing the chasm and how as startups um, move from being sort of startups, achieve product market fit and become scale-ups, how do they cross the chasm, in Jeffrey Moore's words, to uh, to meet the needs of their uh, larger enterprise customers? So um, with me today, I have um, uh, Jolene Looney, who is the co-founder at uh, Content Llama, and a uh, fellow Microsoft Regional Director, uh, Alan O'Neill. Uh, I'm going to give you 60 seconds uh, very quickly to introduce yourself and your, and your company and where you are on your company's journey. Uh, Jolene, if you'd like to go first. Sure. Hi. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm Jolene Looney, as you said, Chief Commercial Officer and Co-Founder at Content Llama. Um, we are just over two years old and we're commercially in the market uh, just under 12 months. So Content Llama, um, we source, organize and transform brand content so online retailers can win online. Um, we take out the, the hassle of um, sourcing everything yourself and we provide product images and descriptions directly to retailers in any format that they need. Fantastic. Alan, Databytes AI. Yeah, <laughs> I buy data with AI. So hi everyone, my name is Alan. Um, for my sins, I'm an engineer. Um, I have a lot of sins and an entrepreneur for many years. Um, my company DataWorks provides an engine that collects web data at scale for large enterprise information and data consumers. Um, I've been involved with uh, organizations of many sizes over the years from startup to scale up. Um, and my current company, started when I was set a challenge to build a better, a better mousetrap by some of my customers or, um, in my case, a, a better web engine. Um, so uh, for anybody who's um, familiar with the, the, um, the journey of startups and who's familiar with the, the concept of the, the chasm and pivoting and all those different things, um, uh, my approach was slightly different rather than going out and um, find a problem. Um, I had customers who came to me and said, "We have a problem." Um, so, so, can you? So I'm going to stop you right there and hold and hold off on that because that's a topic I want to dive into more into a lot more awesome. detail about alternative ways to, uh, to to bridge this chasm. So, I'm going to hold you off on the, on, sure. on that one. So, as I said, my, I'm named Steve. There, I'm the CTO and co-founder of DevOps Group. Uh, DevOps Group's mission is to make cloud and DevOps adoption fast, secure, and simple for our customers, empowering them to uh, succeed in the digital economy. Uh, so, you know, if you if you're looking to do cloud adoption and you're looking to do DevOps adoption, come and have a chat to us. Um, I'm going to do a very quick intro to, to Jeffrey Moore's book, Crossing the Chasm, for those people that are not familiar with the concept, because if you're not, then a lot of the questions we're going to be asking in this session is not going to make a lot of sense. This is going to be no more than five minutes, and then we'll we'll, we'll stop the uh, screen share, and we're just going to have a discussion. As I said, in the in the chat, please, please, please submit uh, submit questions, uh, real challenges you, you face. You know, also just submit your, your thoughts. You might have said, oh, well, we, 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 we dealt with this problem in a different way and we, we can bring that into the, uh, the conversation today. So uh, Crossing the Chasm, written by, by Jeffrey Moore uh, back in the 90s now. And the main message of, of, uh, of the book 
is that there is a gap between the early market, those innovators and early adopters. So the, that 16% of the market that sits two and three standard deviations away from the, um, uh, from the mean in the middle. Um, and but the, between that gap exists between as you move from these early adopters to the early majority. I mean, that is because this idea that the, the needs and wants and the approach, particularly to technology and to innovative products, um, is very different between the innovators and early adopters and the early majority. But it is worth mentioning that, you know, um, 84% of that market is after the chasm. So, you know, the vast majority of your, uh, of your market is uh, after the chasm and that you will start to really see some of your steepest growth as you enter into this chasm and, and, and you really accelerate uh, into the early majority. So in the book, um, you know, Jeffrey Moore talks about these, these early adopters. These are the, the, the visionaries and they are, you know, they're after revolution, not evolution. They're here to change the world. They're here to launch their new product, their new service, their new disruption. And, you know, technology is seen as an agent of change. And because they want their technology to be disruptive, you know, they're, they're looking for 10x, you know, 100x ROI. They're looking for this technology that is going to propel their business to mass scale. And they're, you know, a high risk, high reward customer. But they understand that that leading edge can mean bleeding edge. And they're willing to accept your product that might be not 100% complete. It might still be a work in progress. It might have warts. Uh, it might not have all of the features of maybe some other project products in the market, but it has enough features to meet their specific needs. Um, and, you know, and they're often very willing to work with you to, um, to improve your product and uh, in, uh, iterate on your product because they understand that your product is on this rapid adoption, rapid scaling curve. Uh, and that scaling curve is, is, is critical to this idea of disruptive innovation. But everything changes when you get to the chasm. So the, the early majority, these are established businesses. They have a lot of revenue already. So therefore introducing any change puts that revenue at risk, this idea of value at risk. So they're very much pragmatists. They are after pragmatic, practical solutions that somebody else has proven to work. They, um, they like, they're um, interested in technology and they're willing to invest in technology, but they're not willing to invest in being on the bleeding edge. They're not willing to invest on the pain. That's somebody else has to have to have done the pain. They like market um, leaders. They like trusted suppliers. They want to see the case studies where you've done this somewhere else before. Um, so in the book, um, um, you know, um, uh, Jeffrey Moore, um, uh, you know, goes on to, to say that the way to cross the chasm is rather than try to attack the entire early majority market, um, is to create a beachhead segment. Identify a particular subset of that market that is most um, um, open to your ideas. And, and maybe it's most, you know, might be more closely related to some of the sectors that you've, that you've done with your uh, early adopters. Uh, and then land with that beachhead segment exactly the same way as like you're landing on the beach at Normandy, a D-Day, create that beachhead um, build out those case studies, build out that evidence uh, that is going to appeal to these pragmatic early majority and then expand out from that, um, from that beachhead. But we are going to talk today around some alternative strategies uh, beyond that. But, you know, the main message here is if you try and sell to a pragmatic early majority customer, the same way that you try and sell to one of your innovative early adopters, you are highly likely to fail because the marketing message that is acceptable um, to that early majority is quite different 
um, to the uh, to the early adopters. They're not interested in technology for technology's sake. They don't care that your thing is powered by Kubernetes or you know arguably powered by AI. Although AI is a very popular buzzword right now, which we'll talk about with Alan later. But you know they care about prove to me that this is going to have you know, a 3x or a 5x return on improving my business. I am after those incremental gains that is going to be able to extract more money from my existing customers, prove that it works, prove that it's not going to introduce risk into my business. So, you know, that, that's really going to be the, the topic. Please, as I said, just to reiterate, um, we want to take some questions from, from you guys. And um, uh, that's basically all of the screen sharing that I need to do. Um, so I'm actually going to going to um, throw the sort of first question really over to to, to you, Jolene. When we we talked about this in the in the pre sessions for this this webinar, you kind of indicated that your your business is not quite yet is probably facing the chasm. You probably don't really feel that you've crossed the chasm, but you've still had to pivot your your business based upon feedback from some pretty big customers that you've been lucky enough to engage in in an early phase. Do you want to talk us a little bit about that pivot and how that's worked and what it's meant to <clears throat> Yeah, sure. Um, so I suppose, I mean, we, we, we've stuck to, you know, the, the essence of what we were doing, which is building software to uh, automate a manual process, which is workflow management around digital content. Um, but certainly probably on the it was definitely on the back of COVID, in fact, um, that we realized that what we had built the platform to do, which was ingest brand information in all manners, um, in all descriptions and deliver it to a retailer in the format they needed. What was actually missing in the middle, which we wouldn't have discovered um, only through the pandemic, was that whole curation piece, that it, it wasn't enough to kind of pass a problem almost in a way. I mean, the brand content is fantastic, don't get me wrong, but sometimes it needs um, some scrubbing, some you know machine learning and artificial intelligence kicks in where it uh, alters the information just in the formatting, not the actual text um, and the images. So we discovered that through the situation we were all in this time last year. Um, and that was actually a fundamental change to the business. Um, and that now has given us um, a whole different arena in where we sit in the retail ecosystem online. Um, and coupled with that, um, it's opened a lot of different doors to us um, to where we can go with the with the platform. So um, we're, we're really not just another product information management system delivering information. We're actually delivering ETAIL ready, high, um, ETAIL ready, ready to use, beautiful content that nobody needs to interfere with. So retailers can now you know, use their energy and their resources to do other things in the e-com space. Traditionally, to have 40 or 50% of your catalog online was enough. Um, that all changed in the last 12 months. So, you know. <laughs> you, can't, you, can't, you can't survive only selling 40 or 50% of your products, yeah. No, right. so it's 100%. So where, where we come in is, you know, we're not necessarily replacing people or anything like that. It just means that those people can now do what they were intended to do, get that whole catalog online, pricing, promotions, changes, and let us, Content Llama carry the load, so we we deliver beautiful content directly in the format that they need. Yeah, so I think I think it's super interesting if you think look at that through the lens of what we just talked about. You've you've identified that this niche that that maybe your beachhead segment is this curated content, you know, and your niche that your market segment has been COVID related to, to sort of say actually you know, that, that target market is the people that only had 50% of their catalog and very rapidly now need to get 100% of their catalog. So it is it is interesting that you are, I'm sure that as you grow, you're going to add in more services on top of what you've, you know, you've got. But it is, it is interesting you have identified a beachhead and a niche that you're trying to fill in that wider ecosystem of, of, of content, which if, if anybody's not, not familiar and doesn't come from a retail background, that is a massive ecosystem of content delivery and product stuff. Um, Alan, I'm going to I'm going to throw to you. You um, you started to touch on it in your intro, and I, I I told you to stop. That you took a almost <laughs> you almost work, walk you you almost went backwards the, the the other way. You you were approached by some 
you know, early majority enterprise customers that wanted to invest in, you know, um, to incubate uh, you as a, as a startup. Do you want to tell, talk us a little bit about how that came about and, and how has that process worked with your customer? Have you been able to get the feedback and input that you wanted? Sure. So um, for a number of years, um, my main job was as a consultant and um, going in and telling people what to do and how to do it. And um, uh, in many cases, also, I would bring in one of my own teams um, that I would bring in on an ad hoc basis and we would spin up a virtual team and we would do some work and then hand it over to the customer and then walk away. So we were passing around expertise. And, you know, I, I got a particular expertise in web data and big data and the intersection of um, uh, using AI. Um, by the way, what's the difference between uh, AI and machine learning? Just let's get this out of the way, right? AI is written in PowerPoint. Machine learning is written in Python. That's it, <laughs> okay? <laughs> so when people say AI, don't be afraid of it. It's just code. It's just if then else the same as everything else, all right? Um, the most important thing, um, and I, I won't talk about it again with uh, AI, um, just use it as a term, um, is let's not think about it as using it to replace humans. Let's think about it as a way to augment the work of humans. That's the most important part. Now, um, so uh, for many years, I was consulting and I was going into companies who were trying to solve a very particular problem. And they were finding that invariably, either A, they couldn't do it because of their own internal constraints, um, or they couldn't do it because they hadn't got the time, they hadn't got the resources, the usual different things. Um, but yet at the same time, the companies that could do it uh, weren't getting that lift that they needed um, to uh, uh, innovate because of the usual funding and the um, roadway to be able to um, uh, run R&D uh, uninterrupted without having to have the pressure of commercialization, et cetera, et cetera. So it needed a kind of a skunk works. So I was approached after a particular conference where I was, again, telling people what to do and how to do it. And uh, I was kind of called out and, and these people said, well, you're up here telling us what to do. Why don't you just go and do it? And if you do it, we'll buy it off you. And that led to a number of conversations and they basically said, go and build a better mousetrap. And this is exactly what we want you to build. And if you build it, we'll buy it. I said, okay, that's interesting. So we got into a few more conversations and some of those conversations takes, led to- Takes a lot of the risk out. <laughs> it does. I mean, basically, if it was one customer saying, it's like, um, if one customer says to you, I have this pain, I want you to do this. Well, guess what? You're listening to one customer's very particular pain. But if a number of people keep repeating the same thing to you and that starts getting refined over a period of time, well, then you're heading towards a, a problem that might become a business. If it's not, well, then at the end of the day, you're only solving the pain for one customer, and it may not actually be a business that everybody else is interested in. So the big learning for me, first of all, um, was that in helping cross this chasm thing, by having multiple customers validate that they had a similar problem, that helped me get over that early um, issue of, is it something people actually even want in the first place? Okay. Yeah. Um, the second thing, um, that you alluded to as well, um, is that when these big customers came to me um, and I said, well, if I do this, will you help me fund it in whatever way we, we agree, be it through consultancy or whatever, so we can steer this towards what you actually want. Um, and they ultimately agreed. Some of them agreed to do it just as, you know, uh, R&D consultancy that we would pass some of the stuff back to them. Uh, and then ultimately another one said, well, hey, you know, we're actually going to give you a three-year contract for um, uh, a million bucks. Super. Fantastic. Love that. Uh, and then finally, another one says, look, not only will we do that, but we're also going to invest in your company because we really now have you seen what you can do, believe in that, and, and we're going to bring it forward. And that's awesome. Um, what's really interesting is that uh, a lot of us, when we start off uh, in business and we have this idea, right? Um, that's what it is. It's, it's an idea that we, we think it's something interesting and awesome. Um, what this allowed me to do was this allowed me to engage with customers and to create what you just talked about, which is that beachhead, right? Mm -hmm. Because 
um, I went to some customers who are enterprise customers. Um, they want to be very comfortable. They want to see established businesses. They only want to work with, you know, people who have case studies and media proof and all sorts of different things. Um, but I was able to arrange it in such a way because it's such a pain point for these people um, that I said, look, let's almost have a, um, you know, a sub project within your main thing whereby we can test this thing out. But I got them to fund it as the beachhead. Hmm. So once we're now inside their companies and we're proving things to them, um, we're then able to say, um, and it talks also to what you had said earlier about sometimes you, you you don't actually, you're not able to go to a big customer because to cross that chasm, you have to be able to deal with 9, 12, 18 month sales cycles. You have to be able to have Trust the- me, I know, I, I know yeah, that very, very well. You need to have the huge big contracts and indemnities and everything in place that you cannot possibly do as a startup. So the only way that you can actually move forward and even think about jumping that chasm is to have a partner. Prove it. And partnership gonna, is I'm, absolutely I'm, critical. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna pause you there because we've actually got a, a question which is very very relevant um, um, here. Uh, Matt Seymour asks, you know, how do you support the time and effort required by enterprises, especially from small uh, small companies? From past experience, enterprises expect another level of support and handholding to get going. And um, I'll, I'll kick off answering this question from from the, the DevOps group point of view. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, we actually have two divisions. Well, actually, now we have three divisions in our business. We have our enterprise division, our digital business division, and our academy division, whose T-shirts I'm repping at the moment. But the um, the digital businesses is aimed at you know working with startups and scale ups and ISVs and and organisations who are a lot more comfortable and a lot more familiar with with technology, and they tend to be smaller pro smaller projects that enable us to iterate faster. Uh, and we can take a lot of that stuff that we learn there um, and, and and use it with those those enterprise boys. But yeah, I mean, to, to answer Matt's question from from our perspective, yeah, we've invested a lot of time and effort in in branding, in thought leadership. Certainly in the early days, I mean, we started DevOps Group in 2013 when you know DevOps term was only coined in 20. 2009 you know back then it just it was such a nascent thing that we were doing a huge amount of education um you know producing blogs writing white papers presenting at conferences you know because we had to try and educate that market in in, in what we were doing um uh and and this i guess the point that you you started to make alan was you know it, if you try and jump into often, if you try and jump into an enterprise market before you're ready, um, you know you 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 don't have the capacity capabilities inside your organisation to succeed in selling into that market. You've got to flex your muscles somewhere else. I know that John Lillian probably talked to this as well. Um, I have two quick things to say. Um, the first one is um, never be afraid to say no. Right. So um, you can kill yourself dead sometimes um, by actually mm -hmm. taking on too much. So never be afraid to say no. Right. The second thing is um, never be afraid to ask for help and also to tell that to your customer. So, for example, there's not a hope in hell that I could be where I am today without having the partners that I do. I'm saying that I'm focusing on my digital side. I'm focusing on the innovation that we're doing and delivering product. There's a huge amount of professional services and handholding that my customers want around my product, but I can't afford the time to put into that. Therefore, I go to my professional services partners and I say, you deal with that part. So number one, don't be afraid to say no, but number two, provide them with a solution. Ask for help. Yeah. Jolene, and do you want to jump, jump, jump in on that? I mean, you know, my understanding of, of the content space, particularly in regards to retail, is it is an ecosystem. Do you have partners that you work with and are they technology partners? Uh, do you yeah. have a channel for reselling and go-to-market partners? Um, sure. How would you deal with that challenge? Yes, yeah, so we're actually just building out our partner channel at the moment because I said we're only commercially in the market um, a year next month, actually. Um, so that's just being built out. But currently our partners will be the brands. So we've nearly 3,000 brands exist in our ecosystem um, and that's growing every week. 
So with regard to enterprise sales and, and Matt's question, yeah, our lead time is quite quickly because it's quite quick because the pain is so massive. The problem is so big. So we're lucky like that. Um, and to Alan's point, you know, we just keep drumming up enterprise business because you don't have to fulfill on every single customer right now. You know, you can say we can only take X amount of customers this month and next month we could take another three and next month, you know. So, you know, having people knocking on your door doesn't mean you have to service them immediately. Um, you just have to to find common common ground and just be honest. I think is the biggest thing. You know, um, anyone in enterprise company has still got the same problems as probably someone in an SME just on a different scale. Um, so How yeah, you, that is a very important to us. Yeah. In, in your con in sort of content llamas sales cycle, you know, Matt has a follow up question about the the lead time and yeah. you know one of the reasons that we structured our business to have you know. Uh, a digital business division that focuses on smaller projects and the enterprise division was because that that lead time the sales cycle was 12 18 months and you know we just don't have the capital to you know very few startups do have the capital to invest in those kind of big sales cycle without some cash flow um did you do, you know what does an average sales cycle duration look for you and has that can you see different customer segments that have different lead times and different sales cycles? And how has that changed, you know, particularly in COVID? Sure. We're similar to you guys, actually, in the enterprise versus digital. So our two beachhead sectors are cosmetics and personal care and outdoor and sports apparel. So we're absolutely <laughs> staying in those lanes. We do not deviate from those lanes. Um, while we'd love to be in hardware and different things and we get asked about all the time, not right now, but that's in the pipeline. Um, so we absolutely stay in those lanes. Our actual enterprise sales cycle is only about four months, maybe six months tops. Um, wow. But we do, we do, and as a result of going to market in the height of COVID when everything enterprise was paused because people couldn't even get deliveries, let alone get new items on their website. Um, so we did absolutely go into what you call the digital, um, what we call the SME sector. So we've continued with that and, and they are our, our everyday clients that are, you know, local, small, maybe new to online or doing their best to, to maintain their web presence online. And they're absolutely fantastic to us and vital actually to to our growth and to, to balance out the books, as you said, being a startup, you know, it's it's peaks and drops financially. So um, definitely with regard to enterprise, we're quite quick in the turnaround um, and we do take SME customers then just to to pace it out. We are a subscription based offering so that yeah. that that helps as well, because you can sign up at any time throughout the year. It's not an annualized lump sum or anything like that. So. And, and I think that's a really good point. Um, um, and Alan, I'll get you to come on on this is about how do you eliminate friction in that in that sales cycle? You know, as part of crossing the chasm, you know, one of the advantages of, of, of SaaS businesses, which I think is, you know, is where your product is, is heading, is that make it easy to sign up. Uh, you know, um, I think I think it was Atlassian for a very long time famously never had uh, a sales department per sale. You know, they they just sold online and this is what you've got, you know, very Henry Ford, Model T, any colour you like as long as it's black. Um, and, you know, they then use partners in the same way that Microsoft and Amazon use us or AWS use us. They The partners you know, created that um, the installation, configuration, customization, you know, which is, you know, the consulting business that you used to be in before you pivoted to become more of a product company. Um, I mean, how's that productization going and, and how are you making it easier for um, customers to onboard and consume? Yeah. So um, uh, you're quite right in that, you know, our, our, our key is that we're keeping our digital, our product completely and utterly distinct from the professional services and the custom tweaking. We don't do it, we don't want to do it, we will never do it, but we are happy to have our partners do it. Yeah. Um, we're in product, we're in and license. What do, you, what, what, do you make a conscious effort to enable your partners though, you know, by creating the APIs, creating the sample material, creating the SDKs? I mean, is that is that part of the mindset about enabling the partners? Absolutely and totally. And what we do as well is, um, uh, one of the things that we do is, yes, we have our APIs and our SDKs and all that kind of stuff. Um, we're very much focused on a, a, a no-code, low-code delivery out to our end users so they can interact, or, interact with it with a um, 
uh, a much lower um, uh, skill set than they would before, so it dramatically lowers that barrier of entry. Um, the other thing we do is we uh, make it very, very easy for them to integrate our stuff with um, the standard enterprise suite, which is um, the Microsoft base, right? So um, we're going straight in. We're saying, well, you use 365, you use SQL, you use um, whatever it happens to be. Well, guess what? Just plug and play straight into them, okay? So make it easy for them. Um, the other thing that we're absolutely massive believers in is the engineering principle of dry. Don't repeat yourself. So if we yeah. find that either either we or our customers um, repeat something more than three times, we say, that's it. Stop everything and productize that. Make that a feature. Yeah. Okay. So, for example, we found in the very early days um, that we were starting to uh, uh, repeat training to customers. They'd say, oh, we need training on that. Say, mm, no. Okay. I don't care how rough and ready it is. Yeah, I don't care how rough and ready it is. Go off and record a video. I don't care if there's cows baying in the background or children screaming. It is what it is. Everyone's in the same boat. Just go and get that thought process down in a video, no matter how rough it is, and share that with your customer. And if it solves the problem for them, well, then we can clean it up later. Okay, but let's not waste your time and their time. Let's get it down in a video because it's the quickest way to transfer a, a thought uh, and bang, we're over there. But this is this is very much, and, and in your earlier um, um, segment, you know, this is very much the Eric Reese um, lean startup idea, build, measure, learn, build something, get that rapid prototype out there, iterate on it as you as you get the feedback. Yeah. Um, yeah. If, 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 what is it, the, the other one there that I, I'm a firm believer in, even though it kills me, it kills me. Um, uh, go ugly, go early. And if you're not embarrassed with your first show to the client, well, then you're too late. Yeah, yeah, yes. If, if, if you're constantly polishing and polishing and polishing, somebody else comes into the, uh, comes into the market. You yeah. know, I think, um, I mean, a great example of this is, 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 is Tesla. Um, the amount of telemetry and data that Tesla is, is gathering from them. I mean, every single Tesla car is is teaching Tesla how to do self driving. You know, we, you know, transferring in some cases, you know, megabytes and gigabytes of data, you know, overnight uh, back to Tesla to give them advice. And you know, that flywheel, you know, uh, from a self driving point of view in particular, is going to be very very difficult for other organisations to think. Yeah. So, I mean, a great you know message for people out there is. Um, Build if you're certainly if you're building a SaaS product, don't skimp on the telemetry. You know, don't skimp on understanding. You know, do you know every time a customer uses a certain feature in your product? You know, how did they choose that selection from the menu? You should know that. You know, and there are open source libraries available to give you that type of telemetry, and there's third party SaaS products that will do it for you. You know, you should know how long it takes to load that page, load that module, how frequently it's used, because then you know if you spent three months building a feature and nobody uses it, then it probably wasn't a very good feature, and you're probably better to remove it, rip it out of the product, because. You don't have to deploy it again. You don't have to test it again. You don't have to validate it, integrate it. Yeah, there's there's um, absolute gold. There's a gold mine in your logs. Go and mine them. Yeah, um, I'm going to say you know a, a, a question around um, sort of the, the the biggest challenge that you've seen so far. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you on that, Jelly. Like, what's the biggest challenge that you've seen so far, and and how did that relate to? You know, business pivots, market segments. You know, you've touched on 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 that curated content becoming. Oh, that's what the customer really wants. So why, why did we not know that before? But I mean, what are other challenges that you've been you've been facing? You know, as you've grown the business and dealt with these bigger bigger customers. Yeah. Um, well, as a company, we faced a lot of. Both, like, yeah, both. <laughs> Both yeah. company and personal. I think that's a really good yeah. way of looking at it because we've got to talk about this as a founders as well. We are people. We do have lives. Yeah. yeah. Let's go. As a company, we faced a lot of tech problems. Um, it's dog eat dog in Ireland trying to get tech talent, keep them, keep them happy, keep them away from the big ones that can pay double what you can pay. <laughs> um, and plus, being a startup, we do. Uh, our platform is actually slightly, you know, it's slightly different to what's out there. We're SWAS, I suppose, software with a service, it's it's managed. So our platform um, 
is never seen by the customer. Our users are internal users. Um, so at that, we, we joke that llamas move at the speed of light. Um, <laughs> Because our, our feedback is instantaneous. You know, we've we've account managers and users internally that are able to say, like you said, that's actually never used or that times out every time I use it. Why do we have that? And so on and so forth. So and then we obviously come, you know, bring solutions to our customers and they give us feedback and we develop them. So that really fast paced environment we found doesn't suit um, a lot of a lot of people, you know, in, in technology. They they like kind of knowing what they're doing slower sprints slower releases whereas we'd be very very quick if we could be so that's definitely been a, a challenge as a company and um, probably the other challenge while demand is is massive um there has been um just a real disjointment in in how people do business now i mean it's been really fantastic in some ways um you know you get to meet everyone and see their kids playroom and meet their kids and it's all lovely the, um, the alarm is in the background Lamb is in the background, yeah. Um, my children are probably gagged on a trampoline right now, telling them to be quiet. Um, but basically, I what we found is, and this is personally as well, um, the cutoff has been very blurred. So 12 hour days have become the norm. Um, just last weekend, I said I wasn't working. That's the first weekend since Christmas I haven't worked. Um, because this thing has come in where it's been, oh, I'll get a look at it over the weekend. And that's just not for me. That's from customers. That's from clients. That's from potential partners and existing partners. This really welded to the laptop, as I call it. Um, mm. It's really this really dangerous. Um, Maintaining a work-life balance. It, yeah, mm. there is none. There is none because the two lines have been blurred. So at least you could leave the office, close the door uh, and get home. Um, that hasn't happened now. So I think... That's definitely been a challenge. We've seen burnout. We've seen a lot of our team very tired. Um, you know, thankfully nobody's you know become ill. But um, even over Christmas, people didn't even want to take time off because they were saying, well, "What are we going to be doing? Just read a book, chill out, have a glass of wine," you know. <laughs> uh, but so I, I, so I don't like that. That's come in, and that's personally, professionally, I see it everywhere. I see it in super value. People are screaming at each other because the queue is too long. You know, everyone's gone very antsy. So, um, so definitely that's something I've noticed and, and I can see it bleeding through into business and commerce as well. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> what about you, Elle? Biggest challenge so far? Mm. Um, I think the biggest challenge um, that I have in this company uh, and the biggest challenge that I've had in most companies that we're trying to, you know, to to start up and then to scale and to cross that chasm is change. And it's change on the customer side. Mm -hmm. When you go into an enterprise, an enterprise is a very particular beast. Um, it is set in its ways. It's not necessarily a dinosaur, um, but it can it moves in its own way. And it's got its own personality and it's got its own um, uh, way of working. And if you go in with a new product, uh, you've got to be sure that you've got buy-in um, on every single level, not only with the um, the people who you want to engage with who are going to use your thing, but also the people who, for example, are going to pay your invoices and the people who are going to um, interact with you and the sort of handover project managers and um, the compliance people and the, the legal people and all these. There's... There's so much different things that you have to do that you think it's being done in one way, but they do in a completely different way. And that clash of cultures can actually make things really, really difficult. Um, and it's interesting what Jolene said about, um, you know, uh, you, know you, you want to move at a certain speed, but maybe your customers or maybe even internally, you know, people don't want to move at that speed. And um, so how do you even do that? And, um, I was talking to uh, um, uh, one of our investors yesterday and um, we were talking about a particular customer and uh, I was saying, you know, they're doing the same thing that they're doing now that they were doing five years ago. Um, and, you know, they're not solving the problem. All they're doing is they're shoving the problem down the line by outsourcing it to a cheaper location every single time, but they've still got the same problem and that's they're not solving the issue. Um and his comment was, well, you know, sometimes 
people can't solve the issue. They've actually got a barrier in these huge, big companies um, that they're not able to do that. They're just entrenched, and be it politics, system, systems, people, whatever it happens to be, they cannot get beyond that. And sometimes you have to say, well, they're a customer we can't deal with. You actually have to leave them and move on. And I, and I think, I'm going to jump in there. I think, you know, you said it earlier about, you know, learning to say no. And certainly for from, from my company, it's like we're eight years, we're eight years old on Saturday. Um, the Probably the journey of our company has been learning to say no. You know, we, we started by trying to be uh, a complete all singing, all dance, dancing DevOps transformation company. And because we were early adopters in the market and people were coming to us, how do I adopt DevOps and this sort of stuff? And we learned over time that because these enterprise organizations were such enormous beasts um, and they had their own culture and they had their own ways of working, um, that trying to be an external agent for change was very, very difficult unless you had massive a massive injection of political capital, which is like the CEO was standing behind you saying, you will do will do this. And that is very, very difficult, you know, particularly with an organization of our size. We're only like, you know, 20 people, we're like 70 people now. So, you know, we've been refining our value proposition to be, you know, DevOps enabled cloud migration. We know that people want to adopt cloud. That has crossed the chasm. That has gone mainstream totally in the last year, year, 18 months. And very much that if you want to get all the value from cloud, you have to adopt DevOps at the same time. If you simply take those virtual machines in your data center and plop those virtual machines into a cloud service provider, you're not going to get all these benefits of agility and scalability, and and uh, you know you're not in the way that you expect. You know you've got to adopt these DevOps ways of working. But you know trying to change those organizations was was very difficult. And and I think you know again think about core messages, being willing to say no. <laughs> Is absolutely a, a, a message that we that, that we had to learn, and I think I think Jolene touched on it as well. You said very clearly, we're doing sporting goods and cosmetics, and at some point we might do something else, but we're going to stay in our lane. And, and I think that that yeah. is super super critical. It's probably a more of a nut right now as opposed to a no, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and sometimes it is trying to manage. It's trying to manage that conversation. Sorry, Alan. I'm I'm wondering as well from Jolene's point of view. It's interesting that um, uh, you could say, right? Well, I'm like completely product driven. Um, DevOps groups are uh, you, you, you're now split, but you probably started off being very service driven, maybe. Yep. Um, whereas Jolene now is very. Um, uh, I, I don't think you're necessarily service driven because you're, you're you're still producing a product at the end of the day. But the interesting thing to me is that your technology is inward facing, right? So you're not trying to um, uh, innovate at the speed of your customers' needs. You're trying to innovate at the speed of the service that you provide out to your customers. And how does that look like inside from a change management point of view how does it look like from a um uh you know when we're looking at this crossing the chasm thing um, and we're saying right how do you take the leap from sort of you know 100 customers to 10,000 customers or from uh five customers at 25 grand a year um to uh 10 customers at 250 grand a year right? Um, how does that look inside your organization when you're not, um, an, uh, you're not a digital product company, but your company is very much supported by its digital IT infrastructure? So how does that feel? Yeah, I suppose that's, yeah, that's what's behind the curtain. We've actually built our own product information management system and data asset management system. It's, it's right now just not going to get out to the public. Um, so what we've built is something that's very different in how it catalogs, tags, reuses information. Um, so our goal this year is to bring such efficiency internally to the platform that scalability is, you know, it's there, right? So every time we reduce four clicks internally to one, that could save us six euro, 
you know, it's 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 that simple. So everything we equate is back to money. Karina and I, my co-founder, are both business development. We're not tech actually. Um, so it's a very solution-driven technology as opposed to technology-driven technology. Um, so yeah, so that that's really where we're at. That's how we will scale is is through wildly efficient workflows. I know workflow isn't that sexy, but believe me, it costs you a lot of money when you don't get it right. Um, mm -hmm. So what we're doing is a one-to-many approach. So we're, in, as I said, ingesting information from nearly 3,000 brands and transforming that and delivering it out the other side without any work on a retailer or a brand. We're brand agnostic, platform agnostic. So it's a very new space. This has only been a problem in the last five years where you needed to get so much of your catalog online. Um, and the reason we, we, we stick to outdoor sports apparel and cosmetics and personal care is because it's a massively high turnover of SKUs. So it's not a one and you're done. You can't get your website online and just leave it. You know, there's new products every day, every week, every month, and they're high revenue products. So it's absolutely crucial, you know, that they're there. So right now, it's not a piece of technology that the outside world will see. But definitely by the end of the year, probably that SME digital space will become very self-service and uh, very, very user friendly like that. Yeah. So hope that answers your question. Yeah. There, there was a comment earlier on from um, um, Tavo001 and, you know, he kind of was saying that he feels that that, uh, that, that that the new customers are already in the early majority, that the solution has to work 24 by 7 from day one. But and I don't think I agree with that. Um, no. But what he went on to say was, you know, they don't care about DevOps, Azure IoT, Edge, Data Lake, whatever. You know, what I get from, from your experience, um, so our experience is a little bit different because what we're selling is that that leading edge technology and we absolutely have to have a, a technology evangelism part of the business. But our, our value proposition is DevOps Group is helping cloud and DevOps technologies to cross the chasm and cloud and DevOps ways of working and, and thinking. So that is literally our value proposition. We are taking what we learned over here and bringing it to the mainstream. So we do have to talk about technology and evangelize technology. But, you know, I, I think for both of you, even, you know, you're very much, you know, your, your B2B businesses, you're working with, you know, large brands and, you know, a mixture of large and small consumers in your case, but you're both very much abstracting the technology and as you said, you're, you're business people. You came from a business background. I mean, Alan and I are technologists. You're not talking about, you know, Content Llama, you know, runs on AWS or, you know, Content Llama, you know, is, is sitting or, run you know, runs on Azure or, you know, is scalable. Azure. And uses, <laughs> so yeah, Azure, that, you know, uh, Data Lake, you know, it, you know, you're not talking that. You're talking about this is the benefit that's going to bring your brand to your suppliers. This is the benefit it's going to bring to your sales conversion rates to you to, to the end customers you know i think that's super super interesting and i think that's a real lesson for technolo technology co-founders that you really do need to have somebody you know who can whether that's a non-exec director or an investor or just a really friendly customer that is going to help you rewrite your marketing material you know to to take out all the techno babble if you can have a sector on section of techno babble if it's important um because yeah sometimes techno babble is, yeah. is the sizzle that sells the sausage but you've got to talk about business value yeah oh 100 and and i think that's probably been part of our success is that we are very business um proposition value focused so what's this delivering i mean is one of our early customers said to me, because I went down that route, going, you know, I've got a platform, you want to see it? Um, and he said, I couldn't give a hoot. <laughs> I just want you to, I just hope it does what you said it does on the tin. And, and that's it, end of, never want to see it, don't care. I mean, look, it's, uh, you know, I've been in payments pre this, I was in payments for many, many years. I don't think I ever showed anybody the inner workings of a credit card machine and how it got the, the credit card number to cloud and back. So, you know, people want the trust, results. Trust, 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 trust me, I, I have worked on that side in you. It's a bit like making sausages. You really, really, really yeah, don't want really to just, understand how exactly. that thing works. Exactly. So, so that's what we focus on. Um, you know, we, we're, we're, we're selling efficiency, speed, happiness. You know what I mean? Uh, stress eliminator. That's what we're selling. 
Um, yes, we'll, we're bringing amazing technology in the background. And some of our technology is existing technology that we've just layered in such a way it's never been layered before. So it's doing something very different. Um, but that's for our own profit margin. That's to get our gross profit from X percent to Y percent and to offer more speed to our customers. So where we go from X, you know, 12 hour delivery to a one hour delivery. That's all the the sausage making. What we would say in the background, you know, to do what we can do. So yeah. And I think you know, I'm going to bring Alan in here. I think you touched on something there about you started talking about happiness and stress reduction. You know, when you look at the marketing to some of these enterprise customers, you know, they are often talking about um, you know focusing on particular personas, focusing on particular pain points, and focusing on the emotions that they want to engender into those customers. I mean, you know, we did some stuff around our brand values is that, you know, we want to be seen as experts. We want to be seen as collaborative. We want to be seen as pragmatic, you know, very pragmatic, practical solutions. And we want to be seen as authentic. And if we, if we get feedback after an engagement from the customer and they, you hear them use those words, even though we haven't said them to them, we hear saying, you know, your guys really know their stuff, their super thing, you know, and they were really practical, you know, they, 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 they were really pragmatic. They, they gave us solutions that, that met our needs and they were, you know, they listened to us and they were collaborative and, you know, that's what you want. But, I mean, from your point of view, uh, Alan, that thinking about emotions and and selling on value and and reduction of stress is that ring bells for you oh god yeah and actually um for me uh one of the singular most important things to know and jolene will probably blow streams of confetti over me now when i say this from the business development point of view is um when you're selling into an organization you're not selling to one person you're selling to a whole plethora of people. You're selling to a whole group of personalities. And you don't need to just get one person over the line. You need to get anybody who's engaged as a stakeholder over the line. And you need to engage with them. And you need to tell them how their life is going to be made easier and how they're going to look like a hero. They're the two things you need to tell them, right? Because um, uh, in my game... One of the, 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 do you remember the, the, um, the old triangle of um, uh, speed, quality, and cost? You can pick two, but the you can't. Iron triangle. Yeah. 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 Okay. So um, uh, here's a funny thing. Um, now with the, uh, the emergence of machine learning, you can actually have all three. <laughs> right? That's what I'm finding. Um, because one of the biggest problems in my particular field, and, and it's actually, uh, I bet it's a foundation, of uh, uh, Jolene's uh, offering is data quality, right? And uh, yep, yeah, the nods come out. Um, you know, the old thing of, of rubbish in, rubbish out. Um, we have the 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 explosion of, of machine learning and personalization and all sorts of different things that, you know, come off the back of data, 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 which is what you were talking about, Steve, is seeing the insights through, through all that telemetry. Um, but rubbish in, rubbish out. So you got to make sure that your data is is of of absolutely peak quality. And we discovered that sure, our customers they want all this data and and they want it at volume and they want it at speed and everything else. Um, but ultimately, there's this little group of people in the back room who are the ones who sign off data quality, and they're the ones who keep putting up their hands saying, "Yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but." And if you don't make their life easier, you're in serious serious trouble. Right. So you need to understand, I mean, from our point of view, it's the data quality people from somebody else's point of view, it's something else. But you need to understand that it's not just about one person. It's about the um, uh, all of the stakeholders in the organization. You don't just sell into one person. You're selling into numerous people in there and you've got to meet their needs. And I think that if you do what Amazon do and you say, I am going to work backwards from the customer. And I'm yeah. going to work backwards from their pain point. And I'm going to do whatever the hell I can to make sure that their needs are met and to improve their day. And as Jolene said, to remove their stress. That's what it's all about. How can you remove the friction? What I've found is um, in all my years of coming up with wonderful, amazing ideas that nobody wanted to buy, right? <laughs> <laughs> what, I've, what I've found is, we won't talk about the failed startups, right? Um, 
what I found is, is that if you want to find the money, you've got to go where the pain is. It's that simple. Yeah. You go where the pain is. And if you can find people who are in pain, and if you can help them to relieve that pain uh, and move them on, not to replace them, but to augment them, right? Well, then you're on to a real winner, you know? And that's what Jolene is really pinpointing here, that it's not just about um, crossing gonna, the chasm. I'm going to not... start to wrap you up because we've yeah. got five minutes left and there's one more question yeah. I want to get so, to. So, but... so, so I'll be quiet now. <laughs> No worries. You're passionate about your topic and, and, and that's what panels are all about. A panel without passion is a very, very boring thing. Um, I just want to throw uh, one thing in there. Um, if you haven't read Dan Pink's book, uh, To Sell is Human, uh, well worth a read um, and really talks about how we are selling, we're selling ourselves, we're selling our ideas, we're selling, you know, constantly. And I think, so I think, you know, to that, that, that point you made around, Every conversation that you have is an opportunity to sell, even if it's just an opportunity to influence that person's way of thinking. You're not going to go in there with a hard product sell. I think those days are gone. It is about how can I help? How can I take a pain away? Um, and I think that's really, really key. Um, I want to just come on to uh, one last question from, from um, Hamad. Thank you, Hamad. Is where do you think things are going post pandemic? And we've got like four minutes left. I'm going to take the first minute on that. Um, look, you know, it's a it's a running joke. You know, who, who influences technology transformation in your organization? The CEO, the CIO, the CTO or COVID-19. And it's absolutely COVID-19 for the past past year. So you know, we have seen, you know, massive wide scale, you know, adoption of, of technologies. Um, you know, Teams has exploded, you know, from a, you know, a relatively new product to a massive mainstream product. Um, you know, we've seen an acceleration in cloud adoption. Um, you know, demand for our services is going up. Um, remote working, the genie is out. N nobody can say that you can't remote work because for a lot of people, they've been doing it for eight, you know, for, for 12 months. Um, and people need to understand that the, the legislation says that you must be given the right to work at home unless your employer can prove that you can't work from home. And guess what? A lot of employees used to say, no, you can't work from home because I say so. And you've now got 12 months of evidence to say, do you know what? I can work from home. So legally, putting the, 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 that, that genie back in that bottle is not going to happen. I do think there will be a bigger shift back to workplace employment than some people are predicting, but that, that genie is not going back in the bottle. Um, so Colleen, a minute, what do you, where do you think things are going um, post pandemic? Oh, I mean, I'm going to have to stick with online sales, haven't I? Um, yeah. So I, I just I saw this from somebody else. I can't even remember the full quote, but it's like you, you don't go back to hailing a taxi in the rain once you've experienced Uber. You don't go back to renting a DVD once you've experienced Netflix. And um, so I, I don't I can't see people. And I, the statistics are there. Eighty percent of consumers said they'll continue their main shopping online. So I think that's going to happen. What I'd love to see happen is grocery improve. I personally cannot grocery shop online because I find the experience horrendous. Um, yeah. So I'd like to see grocery shopping improve. I'd like to see curbside collection, click and collect improve. I don't think everything has to be DPD or, or whoever delivery. I would like to see a lot more of that. Car park pickups, you know, all that type of cool stuff that you can just go on an app, order your butcher and pick it up half an hour later. So that's what I'd love to see. And I think that's absolutely where it's going. And I think information is king. Informed decisions are what's going to make the difference at the end of the day. The whole story of the 21st century is reducing information asymmetry. And a lot of organisations don't understand that, that when, when the suppliers, when the customers and the suppliers have access to the same information, which they increasingly do, the power you know shifts massively to the consumer. So, Alan, where do you think things are going post-pandemic in 2021? I'm going to give you three guidelines. Number yeah. one, don't repeat yourself. Number two, ruthlessly automate. And number three, augment your humans. That's it. I like you it. Do those things, you're on track for uh, the year 2300, let alone 2021. Hashtag augment the human. We'll, we'll get that. We'll get that trending. Love that. Um, well, I'm going to say uh, thank you, everybody, um, uh, to, to my panelists, uh, Jolene, Allen. Um, and uh, it's obviously the people at, at Reactor. Um, Reactor has posted some additional learning links into the chat. 
uh, and there is a feedback survey uh, going right back to one of the core messages of this session, which is about, about feedback and fast feedback and build, measure, learn. You know, we'd love to get your feedback. That's how we can make these sessions um, more, um, uh, more relevant and uh, higher quality for you, the, our audience. Um, so please, please, please um, send in that feedback and, and tell us what you thought of today. Suggest topics for, for other segments. Um, um, the Microsoft for Startups um, and program um, is working with the regional director program that uh, Alan and I are part of. Um, and, uh, you know, we are available as, as mentors for startup organizations through the Microsoft for Startups program. Um, so with that, say thank you. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you, Alan. And thank um, you. I see you all at the, uh, at the next event. Take care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.